So we're going to talk about a scripture that we all know really, really well. We've, uh, we've probably all gone to vacation Bible school and had it. If any of us did Sunday school or children's church or you know any kind of thing like that in our youth, we probably know it. Pastors have preached on it for years. So yes, we're going to talk about one that you're a little bit familiar with, but I want you to look at it in a different light. We're going to look at not the whole of Peter's failure, if you will. Um, the scripture we're going to look at is right after Jesus has fed the 5,000, and he wants to go away by himself to pray. Jesus likes to do that. And he tells the disciples to get in the boat and go ahead and meet him on the other side because he's getting ready to go to Gethsemane or whatever. So he's going to, then that's where he uh, ministers to the demoniac. So he tells them to go. He goes. Night goes on. The disciples are on the boat. They start to cross. They haven't completely crossed yet. It's the middle of the night, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. probably. A storm kicks up. There's a lot of wind. There's a lot of waves. There's a lot of stuff going on. And the disciples are in the boat, and Jesus starts coming on the water toward the boat, and the disciples freak out. They're like, it's ghost. <laughs> Jesus died, and we weren't paying attention. <laughs> he died, and he's come back as a ghost, and he's going to kill us or haunt us one because we weren't there when he died. They're freaking out because his ghost is walking. And of course, Jesus is like, don't be ridiculous. It's me. And so Peter's the first one to step up and say, okay, sure, prove it. And Jesus says, come. There's a lot of times in our lives when... Jesus wants us to do something, and we go, okay, though, but prove it. And all he says is, come. Yeah. You know, do you want to be with me or not? So the scripture we're going to look at it tonight is Matthew 14, verses 29 through 32. Like I said, I, I don't want to pull it out of context, but that's the background, and we're going to just jump right into after Jesus says, come. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him, and said to him, You have little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. So I want you to think about walking on water, just like Peter, just like Jesus, however you want to, whichever side you want to take, it's all right. I just want you to walk on water. <laughs> and that's what we're going to look at, obviously, the name of the sermon is Walk on Water. We're going to look at, think about all the disciples that stayed in the boat. Jesus didn't, like, handpick Peter as his special favored disciple. I mean, there were, if any of the other disciples had said, I'll go, Jesus would have said, well, come on, right? If they all said, prove it, Jesus would have had all 12 of them on the water and then probably had to save all 12 of them. <laughs> He'd be a professional lifeguard by the time he was done. But Peter decides he's going to get on the boat. Everybody else decides to stay in the boat. Now, if I'm perfectly honest with you and with myself and with Jesus, I'd probably be the one that stayed in the boat. The wind is kicking up the waves. And as a fisherman, I'm well aware people die all the time out on the waves. And it doesn't have to be a bad storm for that to happen. Your boat can capsize, especially back then. They didn't have buoys and, and life vests and all the things that we have now with boats. They were just them and their nets. And their nets were super heavy. And so if your foot got caught in that net and it was going over, so were you. <laughs> Check out. You're done. So they knew the dangers of the water more so than even what we know now. And so the idea of getting out of the boat in a storm with waves, insane. And if I'm not sure that that's Jesus, I'm doubly not getting out of the boat. I might think it's you, but if I don't have proof, yeah, yeah, Peter, you go ahead and try that out. I'll go if you go. Kind of I wouldn't be the one I want to stay in the boat. Why? Because the boat is safe. I know the waves aren't going to take over this boat. I've been in this boat a hundred times. I've lived in this boat. I've had experiences in this boat, right? I've, I've had Jesus in this boat. So I trust the boat. It's proven effective. It's proven floatable. It has proven to withstand other storms, obviously. It's still in one piece, and it's apparently doing pretty well in this one. The boat is safe. The boat is comfortable. But the problem is, there's only one thing wrong with staying in the boat. Jesus ain't in the boat. As much as Jesus had been in the boat, as reliable as the boat was, as dependable as the boat was, as logically sound as that decision is, that's not where Jesus was. And so for Peter, at some point in the back of his head, it was, I want to be where Jesus is. Walking on water is cool, but even more than that, I want to be where Jesus is. And he's not here. Now, Peter was a seasoned fisherman, and we know he had a little bit of an attitude, and we know that he's a little, he had more brawn than brains, per se, in his early years. He got smarter. I'm not saying he's terrible, but, I mean, John was the scholar of the group, right? So, Peter just wanted to be with Jesus. He was like, if Jesus is out there, I can go out there. There's no way. And so, Peter decided the boat wasn't as safe as where Jesus is. Jesus said, come, because he called Peter and each and every one of us to do the impossible. What we think is risky. What we think is life-endangering. 
what we think is ridiculous, silly. Um, if somebody nowadays steps out of a boat in the storm with the wind crashing and the waves going, if somebody does that nowadays, we would call them foolish and stupid. And what did they think was going to happen? You would have all of this. If they looked at you and said, well, I thought Jesus was walking over there, we'd be like, sure you did. <laughs> it wouldn't be the case. Peter wanted to do the impossible because Jesus said, this is the only place where you find me. Because I didn't build the boat, you did. I didn't make your friends, you did. I didn't do anything about that boat to make it safe. You did that by your own hands. But in the impossible, I do it all. You don't see Jesus when you tie your tennis shoe. You're perfectly capable of doing that without him. You see Jesus when he saves your aunt. You see Jesus when he heals your kid. You see Jesus when you finally have no other choice but to let Jesus be Jesus because everything you knew that was safe doesn't have him in it. He needs you to get out of the boat so that you can come do the impossible. Now, it's definitely going to be scary because nothing changes in routine. Getting out of the boat means we got to get wet and we got to get gross. There's no way Peter didn't get drenched even before he began to sink. There's no way the waves and the water, and the, he was not dry. And when he got back in the boat, he definitely wasn't happy. I don't know if you've ever been in the water, but I have during a, a little bit of a storm and trying to get out before it gets worse. You don't manage to get back in the boat or up on the dock dry. <laughs> that doesn't happen. The boat is wet. It's uncomfortable. And then you have to sit there till it passes in your wet clothes. If you've gone to an amusement park, you know how miserable you are when walking around in wet clothes if you didn't bring a swimsuit of some sort or a change of clothes of some sort. It's miserable walking around in wet clothes. You're not happy getting out of the boat because it's wet and it's uncomfortable. You don't look your best when you can't do anything but rest on Jesus. People don't see you being amazing anymore. They see him, but they don't see you. And sometimes we worry about what I look like. Do people think I'm crazy? Probably. Probably. <laughs> I will tell you right now, I was in a business meeting with a gentleman one time, a couple of guys, and they were Christians, professed the faith, and they could not wrap their heads around the idea that I was a minister without a paycheck. It was absurd to them. It was, ir it was irresponsible financial planning on my part. It was irresponsible to my lifestyle and to my responsibilities to rely on Jesus to provide for me. They couldn't fathom it. So in that moment, Jesus is calling me to do the impossible, live on nothing. <laughs> and the world is going, that makes me look crazy. That makes me look lazy. That makes me look disinterested. That makes me look... Um, self-important, that makes me look entitled, that makes me look like a charity case. Maybe they think I'm relying on other people. I don't know. But it doesn't make me look good. Nobody's going around going, oh, she's figured it out. They're all going, she's lost her mind, especially in this economy. <laughs> I get that. When you get out of the boat, you're going to be wet, you're going to be uncomfortable because you don't look good. You just don't. Jesus ain't worried about whether or not you look good because it's about giving God the glory. So if you do everything every day the way you've always done it, you're staying in the boat. Because if you are in a routine, nothing's going to change. You're not going to get the opportunity to see Jesus in the impossible. You're not going to get the opportunity to step out into the waves. You're not going to get the opportunity to see what God is calling you to that's bigger or better than what you could have thought of, than what you could have planned. There's many times we pray for things that are difficult for us, that are breaking our hearts, that, are, that have no solution. And when God comes through, it's more than we asked or it's more than we expected. Or it's a way that's just way better than what we would have expected or wanted to happen. That's what he does. He's good at that. But if we don't actually step out and believe, if we don't get out of the boat and we stay in our routine of safety, we don't get to see it. We don't get to experience walking on water because there's safety in routine. Sometimes routine is our boat. I might not know if I change my schedule tomorrow what tomorrow will look like. I'm a type A personality. I need to know my plans and have my stuff mapped out. I don't like having a day that I don't know what's going to happen. Now, as the day goes on, if I get a phone call and there's an emergency, I'm fine with that. But to start the day, I got a plan. <laughs> I'm not good about that. I like routine. I like schedules. I like clear um, agendas. I like my favorite thing in school is when we would get an assignment, like in high school or college, when we would get an assignment, they would provide a rubric. That's my favorite thing. I was like, I could check it off and know exactly what I'm supposed to do, how much I'm supposed to do, what it's worth. And there, were, there was a time a professor in college gave me my assignment back and I had a 99 and I was like, 
I went through and checked every box. What are you talking about? And so I am going. And I was like, your rubric said this. And I quoted my paper where I said it. Your rubric said this. And I was like, so can you please tell me what I messed up in so that in the future on your assignments, I can, I can correct it. Did I use the wrong grammar? Did I have a run on sentence? Was it just something that I just overlooked and edited? And his response was, oh no, your paper's wonderful. You're gonna do great in this class, but don't you believe we all have room for improvement? And I was like, yeah, in my life, but not on a paper. <laughs> That's easy to get 100. My life for sure has room for improvement, but you're not great in my life. You're great in the paper, and your rubric says if I do this, I get this. I have a routine. If this happens, this happens, and I know it, and I'm secure in it. And when it doesn't, it rocks the boat, because the boat is safe, and we don't want to get out of the boat. It's hard, and we don't want to do it. And that's okay. No, I just want to do it. It's fine. The reason we don't want to get out of the boat, the reason we don't want to get on the waves, the reason the other disciples probably didn't, is failure. Nobody thinks they can walk on water. If I step out of the boat, I am going to sink. That is a very easy thing. There's probably not a minister in this town that if you took us all out on pontoon boat one summer and told us all to get out of the boat and walk across the river, that a single one of us would say yes. I bet everyone would be like, I'll sink. Now, there will be a lot of theological discussions of, well, it has to be the will of God to have me walk on water, or it has to be the call of the Spirit, or Jesus has to be, you know, right in front of me with a visual representation. Like, and there will be theological excuses, but the truth is, we understand science and physics, and if you step on water, you will sink. <laughs> it's just what it is. We have to admit that we live in a natural world. As much as we serve a supernatural God, we very much live in a natural material plane here. And so the thought of walking on water for us is ridiculous and dumb for those reasons. So if somebody says, okay, there's a storm and there's waves, walk on water, that's fear of failure. There's no way I will succeed walking on water. And we hate failure as, as a people. Nobody likes failure. It's the worst feeling in the whole world. And I don't know why, because a lot of times just because you fail doesn't mean you're a terrible person. It's just not the thing that was going to happen. But whatever, it makes us feel the worst in the world when we fail at something. The problem is fear is what the devil uses. Fear prevents us from even trying. The disciples didn't even try to get out and see what Jesus would do. Oftentimes we let the fear of whatever Jesus is calling us to, whether it's to minister to our own mother, or to start a new ministry, or to um, start a new journey, or to break some bondage chains of alcohol, or addiction, or food addiction. Maybe he's calling us to move to a new state, all of these things, we let fear go, I can't move to a new state, I don't know anybody there, and I wouldn't know what to do, and if I got in trouble, and we just, we become, uh, it wouldn't work, I'd end up having to come back. I couldn't, I couldn't do it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't work. I can't go on this diet, I can't do this exercise plan, I've done it a hundred times in my whole life, and I fail every time, what's the point of doing it this time? We give ourselves, we give fear the ability to stop us from even trying to step out of the boat. But fear is a liar. It tells you that whatever it is God is calling you to do, you're doing of your own power. I can't succeed at this diet I never did before. You're not the one going to hold your hand through it. Jesus is on board this time. You're not the only one stepping on the water. Jesus is in the water. But fear tells you it's up to you to walk on water. Peter never tried to walk on water until Jesus said come. He didn't do it before Jesus said come. He waited till Jesus called him to see if he would have success. Fear says Jesus isn't even in the equation. Fear says it's up to you because we let our emotions, we let our past experiences, we let other people's past experiences, sometimes other people do stuff and they fail and we think, if they couldn't do it, I certainly can't, right? We look at what they did and we're like, there's no way because they should have been able to. Fear's a liar. It makes us think it's of our own power. And it just comes from forgetting that Jesus called you to go in the first place. If Jesus calls you, he's going to sustain you through it. My kid... Went to college for a little bit. He decided to try to college him after graduate high school. It was not for him. He was not happy. <laughs> he left. And the night, he, the night, a few nights after he left, he was talking and he was very drunk about himself. He was very down on himself. He was very, you know, I failed at this and I, and I couldn't do this and all my, you know, all these other people do this and this is the path you're supposed to take. And I, was, and I realized in that moment that fear had taken hold of him and he didn't understand what life was. We are programmed, all of us, from the time we're old enough to go into preschool till we graduate high school or college or you know graduate school, however far you go, we are taught that life is pass fail. You know, if you do good work on your work, you get to go to the next grade. If you don't, you get held back. 
If you, you know, do good in your work in school, then you get to graduate. If you don't, you don't. If you want to get a good job, you got to have a GED or a diploma. To get the GED, pass or fail. Everything that we're taught in our formative years is pass-fail. The problem with that logic is, though, for God, life is not pass and fail. We're seeing every opportunity to walk on water or whatever the opportunity may be. We're seeing everything as a success or failure opportunity. What if it's not failure? Just because it didn't work doesn't mean it's failure. I told my kid, I was like, life is not pass or fail. Life is figure it out. Literally, that's all life is, figure it out. You keep trying. You try the one thing. If it doesn't work, then that's not meant for you. You're not built for that. You're not called to that. All right, what's next? Because now you know what you don't do. Now you know what's not good for you. Same with dating boyfriends. <laughs> I had a friend when we were growing up, and, and she said, I don't know. And I dated a couple of guys, and she said, well, I don't know. I get kind of shy, and I, I don't know. There's nobody out there that's this, this, and this. And I was like, that's not the point. The point is the first guy you date might cuss like a sailor, but always open your door. So you guys break up and you figure out, all right, and the man I'm going to end up in eternity with, the man I want to marry, that guy, I want him to open my doors, but I want him to clean up his language a little bit. That bothers me. So the next guy, if he's cussing a lot, you're going to pass. And then the next guy comes around and he opens your door and he's got to clean him out. And you're like, all right, this is a good guy. You're in the relationship for a little bit, and maybe you realize he smokes. And you're like, ugh. <laughs> so you break up. And so then you know for the next guy, all right, I, what's important to me is he can't smoke. He's got to open doors and be the, the typical traditional gentleman. And he can't cuss a lot. We'll let him slip, but he can't, that can't be his major. And you begin to form from each guy what things you like and what things you don't like. Because if you don't try something, you don't know what you like. It's hard to sit down and say, I've never done that, but I, don't, but I hate it. You don't know that. You think you will, but when you try there's been a lot of times I've tried something and found out I liked it and didn't think I would. <laughs> and that happens a lot. So when we look at life as if I step out of the boat, I'll fail, versus if I step out of the boat, I'll figure out what I like. I'll figure out what was good about that, what I can take from that, and I'll figure out what I won't accept, what I'm not okay with. And maybe it's something about yourself. Maybe it's I'll figure out I've really got a problem with and I need to work on that. That means I get to draw closer to Jesus because now he can minister. Now that I admit it and I see it, he can help me go through it. He can help me overcome it. That grows your relationship with Jesus. That's not failure. Even if you sink, you have learned and you have grown. That's not failure. That's not failure. And so we have to quit looking at life and opportunities and ministries and anything that comes our way that Jesus calls us to as a pass-fail. I'll be good at it or I won't. This is an opportunity. And if it succeeds according to the world standards and my world standards to, the, to my wildest dreams, if it succeeds, great. If in two years it kind of fizzles out, I've got a bunch I can take from that. I've got some experience I can take from that. I became a pastor here in 2017, and up until that point, I had literally served in every single ministry in the church. Now, growing up, there were times in different ministries where I felt like I was a failure. It didn't do as well. It didn't take off like I thought it should have. And I could have seen that as failure, but I didn't know God was prepping me. It's going to be hard to lead a church and ask people to serve in a position that I'd never served in. With issues I had never come in contact with. With people and personalities that I had never been around. He was prepping me for a bigger ministry, for a bigger call, for what I was supposed to be in the end anyway. So if you step out of the boat, if you risk it and let fear go away and say, this isn't pass or fail, this isn't fear that gets to take a place. This is, if this ministry soar is great, if it doesn't, he's building something in me. There's a plan for this. I might not see it. I might not understand it. I might not even want it. And I'll be very honest. I didn't want it. <laughs> I might not even want it. But the truth is he has a plan and there's a purpose for this. This wasn't a past fail. This was a purpose and training for his future plans. I don't see it and I don't understand it, but God is always working in me. Jesus is always with me. This isn't a pass-fail situation. That's how, not how life works. So when we get out there and those big old waves are going and the wind is blowing and we step on the water and we take a couple of steps and it's, it's not too bad. Our feet are wet, but we're dry. We're taking a few steps so we're doing good. And then we look up at Jesus and when we go to look at Jesus, a wave kind of comes by and interrupts our vision. And we remember oh, it's a storm and we start to sink. I cannot promise you that every time you step out of the boat, you will succeed. I want to promise you that I do. I want you to. And some of you will, and sometimes you will. Most of the time, you're going to start to see. It, it happens. 
I don't want it to happen, but that's life. You may start to sink. But we have to pay attention to what happened to Peter when he started to sink. Peter didn't turn around and swim back to the boat. Peter didn't call out for somebody to give him a life jacket. Peter didn't just give up and go under. A lot of people do that. Well, I'm just done. I tried. It's all I did. <laughs> Peter didn't go, well, I tried. I'm done. It's all I did. Peter didn't do any of those things. Even in, P even in his fear, Peter shouted, Lord, save me. He didn't say, Lord, put me back on the water. He didn't say, Lord, help me walk like you. He just said, save me. I'm out of my element. I can't help me here. And in Jesus, of course, because Jesus is who he is, was faithful to come up. Now, only the impossible can be accomplished if you're with Jesus, because that's where Jesus is. When Peter started to sink and he hollered out to Jesus, the first thing Jesus says, Scripture says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand. Which tells us two things. One, Jesus is faithful. But more importantly, Jesus saw him about to sink and was already moving to him. Because when Jesus was in the water and said, come, he wasn't close to the boat. So if Peter steps out of the boat, takes two steps, and starts to sink, and Jesus is already close enough to pull him up, Jesus was already coming. Jesus was already coming to rescue him, even if he wasn't yelling yet. Because Jesus knew he wasn't going to walk all the way to him. Jesus knew he was going to sink a little bit. Jesus knew he was going to need him to save him, because Jesus knew he called Peter to the impossible, and Peter can't do the impossible. Only Jesus can. And that's where Jesus was ready to catch him. Jesus understood that. The impossible had to be close enough for Peter to reach. See, if Peter stayed in the boat, he wouldn't have ended up holding Jesus' hand. Jesus was out in the deep. Jesus was in the storm. Jesus was in the water. Jesus was walking on the water. And if Peter stayed in the boat, he wouldn't have held his hand. Now, Jesus may have made his way all the way to the boat and got on and sat down, but they wouldn't have been holding hands. And holding hands, especially in Hebrew culture, is a very significant thing because back then you kissed everybody. And it wasn't a like you see on TV either. It was flesh on the mouth you kissed to say hello. That's just how you did it. So holding hands was a very intimate thing. You didn't even touch a woman, let alone hold her hand. So when scripture says Jesus, he held out his hand and Jesus took a hold of him, that's an, that's an intimate form of contact. Because Peter said, Jesus called me to the impossible and I'm going to go. And then, oh no, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm failing and Jesus is going to hold my hand. He's going to take right a hold of me and one, not let me go under, which... You know, kudos, nobody wants to go under. And two, we're going to have a connection. We're going to have a, a level to our relationship that wasn't there before. I might not succeed on walking across the water to Jesus. My ministry might not succeed and make it look real pretty for me to walk all the way to the shore. But I'll tell you what, my connection with Jesus is going to be stronger than it ever was. It's going to be impenetrable. It's going to be unbreakable. It's going to be unshakable. I'm going to have a level of intimacy with God that I have could never have experienced if I had stayed in the boat because Jesus didn't hold hands in the boat. He holds hands in the impossible. I would rather risk it all and end up holding the hand of my Savior than staying safe in the boat and just having him sit across from me. I want that intimate relationship. I want that intimate contact with Jesus. We're going to look at the last verse of the passage that we looked at um, when we started the night. When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Even if you stay in the boat, I'm not going to say the only way you can talk to Jesus is if you step out of the van. No. There have been times in my life when I said no. I did. I knew he was calling me something, and I said no, I didn't want to do it. I was scared to do it. Um, I was immature to do it. Uh, I was very much stubborn and in my own head. I'm still that, but at least not as bad with Jesus. And I didn't want to do it, and I didn't do it. So what happens if you stay in the boat? Well, what happened? Jesus got in the boat. Jesus is not going to just leave you because you chose routine. But you're not going to see the miracle. You're not going to get the relationship. You're not going to get what comes from stepping out of the boat. He's still going to come to you in the boat. He's still going to get you across and, and calm the storm. Those things are still going to have. He's still coming. But if you go where Jesus calls you, you get to be a lot closer. Your relationship grows. And that's the whole point of what we're doing. Now, the other thing I want to call attention to is when they got to the boat, the wind ceased. So Jesus comes out, the storm's kicking up, the waves are going, the wind is going, and the disciples see a, a ghost, a ghost Jesus, and they're scared, and Peter says, it's a you, Jesus comes, Peter gets in the water, Peter sinks, Jesus saves him, they get in the boat. Jesus says, when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. 
Jesus didn't stop the wind and the waves when he started walking on water. And I don't know exactly how you walk on water or how that magic works, but I imagine it probably would be easier to do if they were still. Plus, if there's wind and waves, even if you're walking on water, Jesus is getting wet. I would rather be still, so at least just my sandals and maybe the bottom of my robe got wet. I don't want my whole thing getting wet and sitting in the boat wet on my. <laughs> so Jesus doesn't calm the storm so he can walk on water. He doesn't calm the storm when the disciples start freaking out that he's a ghost. He doesn't calm the storm when Peter says, prove it. He doesn't calm the storm when he tells Peter to come. He very well could have said, calm the storm and they said, all right, Peter, come on. He could have done that. Peter may have been a little bit more successful, quite frankly, if he did that. He didn't do all of that. Instead, Jesus waits until he gets back in the boat to calm the waves, to calm the storm, to make it all settle and calm down. He didn't get rid of the chaos to Peter's journey so that Peter would do it successfully. He needed it to be impossible so that everyone, Peter as well as everybody that was watching, the disciples in the boat would understand only Jesus could do that. There were no tricks, there were no strings, there were no magic mirrors or whatever it is magicians use. <laughs> there was none of that stuff going on. He didn't get rid of any of that. Because chaos comes in our life. We don't want it to. We don't like it. It does. This is the world we live in. But we also know that peace is a fruit of the Spirit. The closer we are to Jesus, the more peaceful we are in the storm, right? You can't rattle my cage if I know Jesus has got forever. I, you can't. You can't get to me that way. And so... Jesus is, is demonstrating here that when he unites with us, that's when the storm stops. Because see, out in the waves, he wasn't united with Peter and the disciples yet. When Peter got out of the boat, they weren't together yet. Only when he and Peter united again with the disciples did calm come. Because the only time we're ever going to have peace in our chaos is if we're with Jesus. We can try all we want to settle the chaos. We can try all we want to get rid of the storm. Not until we reunite with Jesus do we get there. When we're side by side with Jesus, it stops. So I want to ask you, what's your call? What's Jesus been kind of picking at you about? Because he'll ask me, and I'll kind of think it's him, but I'll ignore it because I don't want to do it. <laughs> and he'll ask me again, and I'll ignore it because I don't want to do it. It takes him a little bit to get me to jump out of the boat. I do jump out of the boat, but it takes him a few knocks. So, and a lot of us are like that. I don't think it's just me. So we have to think, what is it God wants me to do? Is he, what is the thing I'm telling God? I'm not smart enough. I'm not brave enough. I'm not thin enough. I don't know the scriptures enough. Um, I, I don't have enough influence. I don't have enough power. I don't have enough followers. I don't have enough tech. I don't have a, enough. That had me with the network for a long time. I don't have the tech. I don't have the cameras. I don't have the, I, I can't do that. I don't have, all of the reasons we can't do it. Your call usually is not easy. It wasn't easy for Peter to step out of the boat, especially when none of his friends went with him. That's hard. <laughs> Your call isn't always easy. It's not what's always been. Usually it's something you've never done, which is why you get afraid of it. You've never done it. It may be similar to things you've done. Like I said, you could build on it, but it's usually something you haven't actually done. And it usually requires you to separate from the pack. Peter went alone. Nobody went with him. All the disciples sitting in the boat. And they remained in the boat. <laughs> Nobody got out with him. Nobody encouraged him. Nobody said, you can do this. They all sat and thought, you're nuts. Because that's a ghost Jesus. <laughs> they, they weren't ready to believe. They weren't ready to believe. So don't get mad when you find that you separated from the pack and nobody's standing with you and you're standing there alone. Don't get mad at them. They're not ready to believe like you believe. They're not ready to see Jesus the way you see Jesus. They see him as a ghost. They see him as a legend, as a myth, as an um, incorporate being that kind of floats around. They don't see him as an intimate, hand-holding friend. They don't see him like you do. They haven't got to that point spiritually that you've gotten to. Let them watch. It's going to be hard to do it alone. Again, I know I have been there. <laughs> it's, it's hard. But that's how you know Jesus is in the middle of it. That's how you know you're in the deep. It requires a great amount of courage. And it requires a great amount of humility. It took courage for Peter to step out of the boat. And it took humility for Peter to admit, I'm sinking. I'm sinking and it's my fault. Because even Jesus said, you have little faith. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Seriously, you were walking on water. You were doing it. And you doubted and you sank. And I was standing right here. Even Jesus said, Peter had to be humble enough to say, I couldn't do it without you. I lost sight of you. 
I lost sight of where you were standing. I lost sight of what you were calling me to. In spite of all of that, I want to encourage you tonight to do the impossible because he's called each of us. Our worship lyrics tonight at, our, um, at the end of our, our song was Peace Be Still. And she says, say the word and I'll set my feet upon the sea till I'm dancing in the deep. She's dancing in the deep because in the deep is where Jesus is. And as long as Jesus is in the deep and you're willing to step out of that boat, you're willing to say, all right, sink or swim, Jesus has got me, I promise you are going to walk on water. Father, we're thankful for calling us to walk on water. We're thankful that we see the impossible and you see the absolutely doable. We're thankful that we see fear and we see obstacles and we see um, conflict and we see chaos. And Lord, all you see is calm and peace and joy. Lord, all you see is your purpose and your plan being fulfilled. Lord, I pray when we have those moments of doubt, those moments of fear, those moments of insecurity, Lord, that they're immediately placed with your goodness, that they're immediately replaced with your Holy Spirit, reminding us that we are found in you, reminding us that the relationship we are building with Jesus cannot be rushed, that it cannot be manufactured, that it has to be done when we dance in the deep. Lord, I pray that you reveal situations, you reveal callings, you reveal purposes so that we can take the chance to walk on water. Lord, be faithful. And Lord, let a testimony rise from our lips as we see you be everything you've always promised you can be. Lord, let us be your covenant people who go to minister to all nations and to disciple all people. And Lord, every time we step out of that boat, God, let us take hold of the hand of Jesus and just see you be faithful. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.